So, we ended our previous lecture by defining what is called a polyhedron. So, I will just revise that for you quickly. So, a polyhedron P is, uh, is a polyhedron is if it is the intersection of finitely many half spaces. So, if you can find finitely many half spaces, so the, that such that their intersection defines is equal to p, then that then p is a polyhedron. So, what this means is there exist some say m of these m of m vectors a 1 till a m in R n, let us assume b is a subset of R n, there exist these m vectors in R n and also m scalars like this b 1 till b m such that p can be expressed as the common region that belongs to all of these, these half spaces defined by these vectors and this these constants. So, so p is, is x such that a i transpose x is less than equal to b i for all i going from 1 till m. this in we as I said we can consolidate these a's by writing them in the fol in this way you write say for a 1 transpose as the first row of a matrix a 2 transpose as the second row and so on all the way down till a m transpose that gives you a matrix a you put the b's together in a in a vector called b and then that gives you that p is actually nothing but the region x defined regions uh, defined by x such that a x is less than equal to b. Okay. So, it is the region that is defined by finitely many linear inequalities. Now, this is the, uh, this sort of way of defining a polyhedron where we first say it is the intersection of half spaces and then you go about finding the half spaces and give you that gives you this sort of representation. Now, a polyhedron may not have uh, may have multiple representation. So, on the face of it what looks like a poly what looks like it is not a polyhedron could also end up being a polyhedron right. For example, here if you if you if you look at this uh, if, if you look at this kind of representation this is saying that the polyhedron is all the x's that satisfy some linear inequalities right but then you can also have a, a set like this so let me show you for example let's look at this set in r2 so this is plus 1 this is minus 1 0 minus 1 plus 1 and uh, I am looking at this B. So, this region what is, what is this region? Well, this is one way of representing this region let us call this set P. Um, this region let us call this p. One way of representing it is to say that, well this is x in r 2 uh, sorry r 2 such that if I look at the absolute value of the first coordinate that is less than equal to 1 and the absolute value of the second coordinate that is also less than equal to 1. So, the absolute value of the first coordinate and the absolute value of the second coordinate are both less than equal to 1. That is actually this region, right. 
both coordinates have uh, uh, any point in this region, you take a point say here for example, or here wherever you want, it if you look at its coordinates, it is in absolute value they are less than equal to 1, that is actually this region. But if you look at these inequalities, the absolute value of x 1 less than equal to 1 and the absolute value of x 2 less than equal to 1, these are not linear inequalities, right. They can, they are not of this kind because the absolute value function is not a linear function. The absolute value function is a, the absolute value function, how does the absolute value function, what does the absolute value function look like? It looks like this, right. So, this is absolute value of, of t and here is t, this is 0, this is going to plus infinity, this is minus infinity. Right. So, the absolute value function is not a linear function. So, if you look at these inequalities, I have written t as an intersect as the common region of two non-linear inequalities, right. So, it, so, but that does not mean p is not a polyhedron, okay. The point is p is still the intersection of half of finitely many half spaces and what are those half spaces? Those half spaces can be seen here itself. So, you can take this as this as one of the half spaces, you can take this as another half space, take take this as another half space and then finally, this as another half space. The common region be, between all of them is actually our set P. No, 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 A transpose x less than equal to B. The definition of a half space is that it is A transpose x less than equal to B, right. So, you have, so what we have is that this P is, if you look at it in one way, it is defined using as the common region in, as, as a common region of nonlinear inequalities. Whereas, if you look at it in another way, it is actually the intersection of finitely many half spaces. This is a, so because it is an intersection of finitely many half spaces, it is a polyhedron, okay. That is, so the point is this, this here is our definition of a polyhedron. And from here, we, all we can say is that there exists some way of representing it as a, as an intersection of finitely many half spaces. Okay. That means, there, there exists a 1, a 2 uh, up till a m and b 1, b 2 up till b m such that their intersection gives you p. Okay. Now, they may not be the, the one that you have chosen at the moment. Here, you have chosen some inequalities, they are non-linear inequalities. That does not mean there are no linear inequalities that will describe the same region. Right. So, in particular, you can see, observe here that p is also the intersection of of these inequalities, right. So, x the absolute value of x 1 is less than equal to 1, if and only if x 1 is less than equal to 1 uh, and also greater than equal to minus, sorry, minus, less than equal to 1 and greater than equal to minus 1. And likewise, for x 2 also. So, these are actually the half spaces that I have just highlighted here. So, these are these, this is, this here is one of your inequalities, this is another inequality, this is another inequality and this is another inequality. So, there are total of four of them, you can put them together in a systematic form, x in R 2, x 1 less than equal to 1, x 2 less than equal to 1, x 1 minus x 1 uh, less than equal less than equal to 1 and minus x 2 less than equal to 1, right. So, those will define our four half spaces. Is this clear? Okay. So, a polyhedron is the uh, intersection of finitely many half spaces. Now, this as I and of course, you can uh, objects this what this example showed you was that objects that on the face of it may not be written 
as an intersection of linear inequalities can still be turn out to be polyhedral. Okay. Now, another thing to point out here is the importance of finite. Okay. If I do not allow, if I allow for infinitely many half spaces, then many, many sets end up being polyhedron, which are not really what we want them to be. Okay. So, for example, just take the circle. As circle with this the region inside, I, I I take a tangent here. I can this circle is actually the intersection of all of these regions, right? This region defined by this tangent, this region defined by this tangent, etc. This region defined by this tangent, etc., etc. I draw a tangent at every point. I'll get infinitely many such tangents infinitely many such half spaces, their common region is actually the circle. The circle is not a polyhedron, okay, because it is not an intersection of, it cannot be written as the intersection of finitely many half spaces. Okay. So, now this is one uh, kind of th uh, issue related to representation, where you uh, a polyhedron that uh, can, uh, you can have a set which is represented by nonlinear inequalities and can still be a polyhedron. The other type of issue of representation, which I want is, is what is extremely important for optimization, which is what I want to talk about right now. So, this is the, uh, for this we need a couple of concepts. So, let me introduce these concepts for you. First is what is called an extreme point. So, Consider as some convex set. Okay. Now, x is said to be an extreme point. if the following is true. Following implication is true. That means, the implication is that x can be written as a linear combination of a convex combination to be precise. So, of two other points in S. So, x is equal to lambda x 1 plus 1 minus lambda x 2, where lambda is strictly greater than 0 and x 1 not x 1 not equal to S 2 belong belong to S. Okay. So, if, if x can be written in this way, then it should imply, okay, sorry, uh, if x, let me remove this, x can be written as in this way, where x 1, x 2 belong to s, then this should imply that x 1 equals x 2. So, if x can be written as the convex combination of, of two points using a strictly positive weight for each of them. So, x can be written as uh, uh, some lambda which is uh, uh, x 1 plus 1 minus lambda x 2, where lambda is strictly positive. Okay. Then it has to be that x 1 equals x 2 and when x 1 is equal to x 2, they are actually both equal to x itself. Right. So, uh, uh, an extreme point is a point that cannot be written as a as a strict convex combination of two distinct points in the set. Okay. So, uh, an extreme point is one for which this implication holds. So, whenever you try to write it as a convex combination like this of two different points, you well you are it has to be that those two points are actually the same and it is equal to uh, 
equal to the point itself as a convex as a strict convex combination of two points then the two points have to actually coincide okay so what does an extreme point look like let's take for example just i was just writing drawing a circle takes a, the circle is a convex set what are the extreme points of this set every point on the boundary is an extreme point right because the circle doesn't have if you take any point on this bound on the boundary if you try to if you were able to write it as a convex combination of two other points then the circle would end up having uh, uh, would end up having a flat uh, flat surface so this 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 sort of point cannot be written as a convex combination of two other points in the set every point in the interior can of course be written as a convex combination of two other points just always there are always two other points around it you you know whose midpoint will be this point so every point on the boundary of of the circle is actually an extreme point of the circle so the point the extreme points actually are more interesting when you are talking of polyhedra so if i draw a polyhedron like this this is an intersection of half spaces okay so the half space is being this this half space this half space this half space this half space and likewise this half space so now tell me what are the extreme points of this polyhedron once again a point here in the interior cannot be an an extreme point oh yes of course sorry i i i said convex combination but didn't make that clear yeah yes lambda strictly between 0 and 1 yes yes so so any we'll come back to the polyhedron here so this sort of point is not an extreme point what about uh, uh, what are the other points which cannot be extreme points yeah so if i take some point here in the middle of an edge here this sort of point is also not an extreme point because i can write it as a convex combination of two other points like this if i so eventually if you think about it what remain as extreme points are actually only these points this one this one this one this one and this one right these are the extreme points of this polyhedron let me draw for you another kind of polyhedron so this is an unbounded polyhedron so what are the extreme points of this set this set this goes on forever what are the extreme points of this the it has only two extreme points which is this one and this one these are the extreme points of this polyhedron right okay now this this actually this figure is actually very interesting if you think about it that this polyhedron is unbounded so that what does that mean there is a sort of a direction here along which if you keep going you know this sort of direction just imagine you started off from here and you you keep kept proceeding along this direction you keep going going, going you will remain in the set there are directions like this for a polyhedron okay once it's unbounded the very fact that it's unbounded means gives you that there will be some direction along which you can travel such that you will never leave the set right so and what is amazing is that these directions are such that they don't it doesn't matter where you started from means so if there is a direction like this let's say a direction like this along which if you can so if you started from a point here and went in this direction forever you will remain in the set but i can go along that direction starting from some other point also in the set 
and I will still remain all forever in this. So, for instance, I can start from this point here and still go in this direction and remain in the circle. So, there are directions like this, once this polyhedron is unbounded, there are directions such that if those directions are such that you can start from any point in the set, keep walking along that direction and you will never leave the polyhedron. These directions are what are called extreme rays of the polyhedron, uh, sorry, these, are, these directions are what are called rays of a polyhedron, I'll, sorry, my, not extreme rays, they are called rays of a polyhedron or also called recession direction. So, so a ray, okay. so, the, so this actually this, this particular thing that I just mentioned, this does not clearly require the set to be a polyhedron. So, long as it is a convex set, you start if there is a direction along which you can keep going starting from some point, you can go along that direction starting from any other point and you will still remain in the set. This is the shape of, this is the nature of the shape of convexity, okay. So, a ray is defined like this. So, let us consider, consider a convex set, let us take that convex set. Consider a convex set. A vector d in R n is called a ray of S if the following implication is true. x belongs to the set S implies that x plus mu times d belongs to the set S for all mu greater than or equal to 0. So, yes, yeah, yeah. So, if it is unbounded then if it is bounded then the only such vector will be d equal to 0. No, so, once x is in S, this x plus mu d is in S for all mu greater than or equal to 0. So, the so x plus mu d is, so, so the way you should look at this is that here is your point x, here is the direction d, x plus mu d as mu great is since as you go from for mu greater than larger and larger mu you keep going along this this dotted line that I just drew further and further from x along the direction d. Okay. So, for all mu greater than or equal to 0, this point belongs to this uh, x plus mu d belongs to s. Okay. So, this, this this such a vector is what is called a ray. Yeah. So, another name for it is called d is also called also called a recession direction. And, and the set of all recession directions is uh, of, of a set S is often denoted by S infinity is so all D such that D is a recession direction of S. This actually is turns out to be a cone uh, and it is called a rece the recession cone of S. It is very easy to check that this is going to be a cone uh, and it uh, is called a recession cone of S. Yeah, so, if the set is bounded, 
then the only vector that satisfy that would satisfy this sort of condition is the vector 0 right. So, in fact, it is this is this is this statement is also true that s infinity this cone is as is equal to just the 0 vector or the singleton set with only the 0 vector if and only if s is bounded. 